see, everyone agrees that the context is important, but the relationalists mean it. The medical model diagnoses and prescribes. Okay. I love medicine was very helpful when I had my knee replacement. The orthopedic surgeon had five protocols that he could follow, and it worked out fine. Okay. You can't do that with human beings when you're talking about their emotional life. What we used to call years ago uh, case formulation. Form, give me the formulation for your case. You've seen the patient two or three times, formulate the case. What, what does it do? What's the motive? What's the underlying pattern? And what's the treatment plan that we have? It's very hard to stay connected to the, the gestalt of the person, uh, his time, his place, and his culture. For some patients, it's um, about self-worth and self-esteem, right? For other patients, it's about their relationship to the other. For some patients, it's about the, the dealing with the, uh, the culture at large and deciding whether they're going to adapt to the culture at large or not adapt to it. For some patients, it's a combination of those things. Right. How do you... Well, of course, it depends on what the issue is that the person is coming in with, but the relational therapists are almost, not quite, but almost by definition interested in trauma. Personal, emotional trauma or sexual trauma or physical abuse, historical trauma, collective trauma, and especially for relational analysts, trying to integrate parts of the self that have been dissociated. Okay. And that's crucial. We get numb. We disconnect from them, we forget them, but every now and then we get these flashes. One of the old ideas was that, the, that there's a unitary sort of core self. And now we're beginning to understand that there are many parts to us. There are multiple selves, not, not like multiple personalities like you hear in the, uh, in the movies in Hollywood, but that there are indeed multiple self states. It, it differs very much than the idea of repression. It's almost like if, if you think about the Aegean in Greece, there are like 2,000 islands in the Aegean, right? And they all occupy a self-state, you can think about it. And so what you want is uh, more communications between the self-states because that way you feel less fragmented, right? So you've got to have ferry service, as much ferry service as you can between the islands. How do, you, how do you help the patient do that? Well, you try to, to, to listen for what they're saying to try to tune into their blind spots as much as possible. But of course, you have to be careful of your own blind spots as you're inquiring about this. And try to bring those blind spots, those self-states that perhaps have been disconnected, bringing it into uh, the, the, uh, the conversation. You learn about the blind spots by having the interactions and the relationships. That's how you learn about the blind spots. In other words, they're also emergent. It's almost like it's, it's as if they don't exist until you have, you can't work on them or know them until you have the interactions. For example, somebody tells you, is talking to you about a, a, a serious childhood trauma and, uh, and you, the therapist, begin to tear up, but they've got like a neutral face, okay? So you ask, you know, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about why I'm tearing up when you're telling me the story and it doesn't look like it's affecting you emotionally, right? That would be a form of an invitation to talk about a dissociated, a disconnected emotional experience that happened in the past. And say, wait a minute, I thought I was saying a nice thing to you. How did it happen that you felt so shamed by me? You know, what was it that felt so shaming or that induced guilt in you or that made you so angry in me? Can we talk about the anger? What do you think about that? Well, then, you know, you could have an interesting conversation about that. Well, no, we don't talk about the anger because in my house, we never talked about anger. Well, if I make a slip, sometimes I'll say, oh, I wonder why I said that. Let's see, do you have any ideas why I said that? You know, so that's inviting the patient in on it. Now, you don't do that all the time, and you don't do that as a matter of technique. You do that in trying to um, go deeper into the conversation perceptions and the patient's understanding um, when in, inquired about uh, emerge over time, but they also emerge in, in the context of being influenced by the analyst's curiosity and the analyst's personality and the analyst's own ideas and subjective 
belief. So that for, it's always interesting to me is what questions the analyst chooses to ask. Because you could have 20 questions that you could ask at any one moment. And um, so the idea is to be as alert as possible uh, as to how you're influencing the process. Mm -hmm. Okay. And because there's no question that you're influencing the process. Okay. The, the idea is how are you influencing the process? And what does that mean for the patient? One of the influences of the relational position has been postmodernism, which questions how the truth is constructed, which also questions the, the Judeo-Christian idea that the truth shall set you free. Uh, first of all, what truth? Whose truth? Mm -hmm. And one has to be very careful about that. In, in previous decades, you know, homosexuality was pathologized. So it was heterosexuality versus homosexuality, and one was bad. Uh, psychoanalysis was gold, but psychotherapy was copper. Uh, autonomy in America was much more preferred than dependency. For some patients, it's um, about self-worth and self-esteem, right? For other patients, it's about their relationship to the other. For some patients, it's about the, the dealing with the, the culture at large and deciding whether they're going to adapt to the culture at large or not adapt to it. For some patients, it's a combination of those things. Right. The relational position is, is uh, very careful about uh, having, uh, 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 communicating or, or believing that it's the analyst that has the truth. It's not like one is healthy and the other one is sick. You know, it's a little bit more complicated than that. So that's why it helps to bring yourself into the room as a therapist. Otherwise, it becomes an artificial kind of engagement. It becomes a positivistic engagement in which the analyst is here and the patient is here. Okay, and the analyst is looking down and maybe the patient is looking up, looking for answers. Whereas in a relational analysis, I think it hovers uh, depending on what the situation uh, is. But it's in a different kind of zone than this zone. I do think that the, the relational analyst has a, a tremendous amount of expertise in terms of how to, how to uh, um, individualize, how to tailor the treatment. So the, the, the closer we get in terms of our subjectivities, especially if we could, I don't have to dominate your subjectivity and you don't have to dominate my subjectivity. Well, we call that intimacy, usually. You know, Socrates used to say, in order to know your soul, you have to look into the soul of another. So you wind up realizing that we're all more human than otherwise.